Welcome to the J.W. Jupiter Reader's Theater. I'm pleased to bring you a reading of the opening paragraphs of Moby Dick by Herman Melville. After the reading, let me know what you think of the excerpt, or Moby Dick in general, in the comments below. These paragraphs are a series of musings on the meaning of the ocean, at first only for the speaker, but then broadening to encompass every person and the sea. These musings build toward the novel's first articulation of its alluring yet terrible sense of what can be called the ungraspable. The ocean in Moby Dick is but one form of it, that the ocean is of itself, and that it contains and conceals mystery that eludes us, mystery that we desire to see and know, but cannot fully perceive, let alone know. Everything in the story that follows this opening excerpt is, in some sense, an exploration of this, this ungraspable. But Melville says it far better, so the better to not get too far out in front of the pleasure and presence of the work of art itself. Call me Ishmael. Some years ago, never mind how long precisely, Having little or no money in my purse, and nothing particular to interest me on shore, I thought I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world. It is a way I have of driving off the spleen and regulating the circulation. Whenever I find myself growing grim about the mouth, whenever it is a damp, drizzly November in my soul, Whenever I find myself involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses and bringing up the rear of every funeral I meet, and especially whenever my hypos get such an upper hand of me that it requires a strong moral principle to prevent me from deliberately stepping into the street and methodically knocking people's hats off, then I account it high time to get to sea as soon as I can. This is my substitute for pistol and ball. With a philosophical flourish, Cato throws himself upon his sword. I quietly take to the ship. There is nothing surprising in this. If they but knew it, almost all men in their degree, some time or other, cherish very nearly the same feelings toward the ocean with me. There now is your insular city of the Manhattos, belted round by wharves as Indian isles by coral reefs. Commerce surrounds it with her surf. Right and left, the streets take you waterward. Its extreme downtown is the battery, where that noble mole is washed by waves and cooled by breezes, which a few hours previous were out of sight of land. Look at the crowds of water gazers there. Circumambulate the city of a dreamy Sabbath afternoon. Go from Corlea's Hook to County Slip, and from thence, by Whitehall, northward. What do you see? Posted, like silent sentinels all around the town, stand thousands upon thousands of mortal men fixed in ocean reveries, some leaning against the spiles, some seated upon the pierheads, some looking over the bulwarks of ships from China, some high aloft in the rigging, as if striving to get a still better seaward peep. But these are all landsmen, of weekdays pent up in lathe and plaster, tied to counters, nailed to benches, clinched to desks. How then is this? Are the green fields gone? What do they hear? But look, here come more crowds pacing straight for the water and seemingly bound for a dive. Strange, nothing will content them but the extremest limit of the land. Loitering under the shady lee of yonder warehouses will not suffice. No, they must get just as nigh the water as they possibly can without falling in. And there they stand, miles of them, leagues, inlanders all. They come from lanes and alleys, streets and avenues, north, east, 
south and west. Yet here they all unite. Tell me, does the magnetic virtue of the needles, of the compasses of all those ships, attract them thither? Once more, say you are in the country, in some high land of lakes. Take almost any path you please, and ten to one it carries you down in a dale, and leaves you there by a pool in the stream. There is magic in it. Let the most absent-minded of men be plunged in his deepest reveries. Stand that man on his legs, set his feet a-going, and he will infallibly lead you to water, if water there be in all that region. Should you ever be athirst in the great American desert, try this experiment, if your caravan happen to be supplied with a metaphysical professor. Yes, as everyone knows, meditation and water are wedded forever. But here is an artist. He desires to paint you the dreamiest, shadiest, quietest, most enchanting bit of romantic landscape in all the valley of the Saco. What is the chief element he employs? There stand his trees, each with a hollow trunk, as if a hermit and a crucifix were within. And here sleeps his meadow, and there sleep his cattle, and up from yonder cottage goes a sleepy smoke. Deep into distant woodlands winds a mazy way, reaching to overlapping spurs of mountains bathed in their hillside blue. But, though the picture lies thus tranced, and though this pine tree shakes down its sighs like leaves upon this shepherd's head, yet all were vain unless the shepherd's eye were fixed upon the magic stream before him. Go visit the prairies in June, when for scores on scores of miles you wade knee-deep among tiger lilies. What is the one charm wanting? Water. There is not a drop of water there. Were Niagara but a cataract of sand, would you travel your thousand miles to see it? Why did the poor poet of Tennessee, upon suddenly receiving two handfuls of silver, deliberate whether to buy him a coat, which he sadly needed, or invest his money in a pedestrian trip to Rockaway Beach? Why is almost every robust, healthy boy with a robust, healthy soul in him at some time or other crazy to go to sea? Why upon your first voyage as a passenger did you yourself feel such a mystical vibration when first told that you and your ship were now out of sight of land? Why did the old Persians hold the sea holy? Why did the Greeks give it a separate deity and own brother of Jove. Surely all this is not without meaning. And, still deeper, the meaning of that story of Narcissus, who, because he could not grasp the tormenting, mild image he saw in the fountain, plunged into it and was drowned. But, that same image we ourselves see in all rivers and oceans. It is the image of the ungraspable phantom of life. And this is the key to it all. Thank you for visiting the J.W. Jupiter Reader's Theater. I'd love to hear your thoughts on Moby Dick in the comments below. Please like, share, and subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed what you heard. And I'll see you soon on another J.W. Jupiter reading adventure.